in time for the quick break and grab something in the meantime. Um, so we will start our uh, last parallel session of working group five. Um, so um, our first speaker is um, Denise um, from Hermes uh, Collaboration. Um, hello. Oh, hello. Can I speak? Yes, yes I, can, I can hear you. Could you uh, bring your slides up? Yeah, okay. Just give me a sec. Sure. So uh, in the meantime, um, for this session, um, it's all the talks are 15 plus three minutes. So to um, reserve three minutes for discussion, I will give a uh, two minute warning um, after 13 minutes pass so that you can have time to conclude your talk. Um, so whenever you're ready, um, please go ahead. <clears throat> okay, so can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, fine. <clears throat> so, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Depends uh, where we are now. So, I would like to give a uh, overview <clears throat> uh, of a recent Hermes result of Lunkyo spin asymmetries. <clears throat> Uh, so, <clears throat> first of all, in this talk, I'll focus on uh, spin dependency, semi inclusive uh, deep and elastic scattering, uh, which <clears throat> basically uh, gives us information on uh, both uh, PDFs and fragmentation function. So, to do such a measurement, uh, uh, we need a polarized uh, lepton beam, polarized target, in ideal case, 100% polarized uh, beam and target, also large acceptance spectrometer, <coughs> and in particular, uh, very good particle identification. So, oh, oh, this <coughs> available uh, at the Hermes experiment, uh, uh, which uh, was located in Daisy Hamburg, uh, I had a longitudinal polarized with up to 60% polarization uh, <coughs> electron or positron beam. Uh, uh, longitudinal uh, <coughs> polarized pure uh, gas target, uh, which can be filled with hydrogen, deuterium, or <coughs> helium. Uh, also, later, uh, this longitudinal polarized target was uh, <coughs> uh, changed, with, uh, changed with a transversely polarized target. Also, this polarized target can be filled with unpolarized uh, gas. <clears throat> so, at the uh, right side, you see a schematic view of Hermes detector. So, green color shows here partic uh, particle identification detector, which include uh, ring imaging, Chernikov detector, uh, transition radiation detector, and color emitter. So, <clears throat> we stop uh, data taking uh, at uh, 2007, but we have uh, still uh, some analysis, several analysis ongoing. So, and uh, now I'll present the uh, result of two of them, which is just recently published. So, <clears throat> first result is the LNQ double spin asymmetry. <clears throat> So from uh, this slide, uh, one can see a cross-section of uh, one can, uh, for DIS uh, with exclusive, uh, when we exclude a uh, transverse polarization. Uh, here you see this uh, FUU, FUL, etc. It's a <coughs> structure function, which is a uh, we are going to measure, <coughs> but uh, instead of directly measurement with uh, structure function, uh, we measure <coughs> asymmetry, which is basically <coughs> a ratio of different combination for different uh, beam and spin, uh, beam and target uh, spins <coughs> cross section. So why we do this? Because uh, when we measure asymmetry, so we basically uh, exclude uh, many some uh, many experimental uncertainties, systematic uncertainties. <clears throat> so also in experiment, uh, we do not directly extract a uh, asymmetry, we instead extract a parallel, uh, only different between these two asymmetries at uh, how we measure <clears throat> target precision uh, along virtual photon direction or along beam direction. Of course, when, uh, in second case, uh, it uh, gives a small admixture of uh, <coughs> transfer target polarization and this contribute from ILT. 
also a parallel uh, relate to Vitol photon nuclear asymmetry A1, like I shown this formula, where is a D and eta, it's just uh, <coughs> the polarization factor and pure kinematic factor. So and this is a result of it, X dependence of A parallel. Uh, so I should say that uh, <coughs> Uh, this result all was already published, uh, but uh, now we slightly increase uh, statistic. So additional, uh, we present two and three D dependencies. And also we extract uh, uh, twist free cosine modulation, which is compatible with zero, which is presented in paper. So from this picture, one can see that <coughs> uh, we have a uh, uh, Strong, uh, strongly positive and rising uh, asymmetry for pions uh, on the proton, which is a bit uh, lower on datron because of a neutron contribution. And uh, basically, uh, flat uh, asymmetries for pions. <coughs> uh, just to better understand uh, <coughs> this rising, uh, and also it's an example of. Uh, Two-dimensional <coughs> picture is a uh, xz dependences of a parallel. So basically, it's a z dependences, but it's uh, <coughs> split it in uh, three slices of x. Uh, in principle, uh, different uh, z region uh, should uh, <coughs> should. Uh, uh, give us uh, access to different uh, quark flavors, but uh, within our uh, precision, uh, we do not see <coughs> any dependencies versus that. Uh, only one what I can say that uh, <coughs> uh, it's already shown in the previous slide. But uh, for high x uh, symmetry is high. <coughs> So next uh, picture is the uh, X uh, pH curve dependences of a parallel. <coughs> uh, uh, here we have the same, uh, <coughs> same behavior dependences, basically it's, uh, flat. Uh, uh, so in principle, a pH curve uh, should uh, <coughs> also reveal to some uh, transverse moment effect, but uh, within statistical, we do not see it. Uh, so only one of the we can say that uh, <coughs> for high x uh, we have a higher symmetries. So <coughs> next point is a charge different asymmetries, which is uh, just basically asymmetries between positively and negatively charged hadrons. Uh, one one advantages of for such asymmetries uh, that in a leading order all fragmentation function is cancelled in such asymmetries, and uh, this only mainly sensitive to PDFs. So, uh, so on the right side, one can see uh, uh, it's just different asymmetries for pion uh, and cation on different target for proton on deuterium target. Uh, actually, one can see what uh, deuterium <laughs> deuteron result. <coughs> Uh, uh, basically, no significant dependencies between uh, pion and cation. And also on the uh, top uh, right corner, there is a comparison uh, with uh, compass result uh, for identified hadrons. One can see that uh, our results are very well compatible with compass one. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so as I told on the previous slide, <coughs> with, uh, uh, church uh, <coughs> helicity asymmetries uh, are sensitive only PDFs, so this gives us uh, access to quark helicity <coughs> in nucleus. So, and uh, here on this picture, I will show this uh, helicity distribution, which is extracted by two different methods. So, one as I told, uh, using this different asymmetries, and another one, which also already published by Hermes almost 15 years ago, <coughs> using a uh, so-called purity mass at, uh, <coughs> uh, actually purity, uh, 
constructed from only unpolarized PDF and the fragmentation function and can be calculated using a Monte Carlo. Actually, what we do with in our previous publication, or for example, from parameterization of global feed. And uh, one can see that uh, with two different methods, uh, two different model assumptions, they give a very consistent result. <coughs> Next uh, <coughs> result. Uh, so before uh, I just uh, uh, talk about constant term. <coughs> this uh, term in a cross section. Now I go to sine phi modulation <coughs> here. <coughs> oh. As, uh, as before, we do not directly extract a specific structure function. Uh, we just extract a ratio of uh, polarized or unpolarized structure function. Basically, it's a sine phi amplitude <coughs> of uh, asymmetry. <coughs> uh, so uh, in principle, this uh, structure function is a twist-free observable, so it's suppressed by uh, transverse momentum. So and they include uh, various contribution of TMDs. We calculate uh, 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 this asymmetry is uh, using a maximum likelihood uh, method, uh, so just excluding this kinematic factor. <coughs> So, and for V, we just put a weight with hadron ID, background, etc. So, and uh, here is a result, it's published a result for beam helicity asymmetries for all uh, six uh, type of hadrons, uh, pions, kions, and protons, and also anti antiparticles. Oh, all this uh, result also available in a 3D projection over X, Z, and pH per binning. <coughs> so and here one can see that uh, <coughs> basically only for pions, uh, <coughs> uh, we can see a clear symmetry, which is arising with Z <coughs> here for pi plus and pi minus. I hope you see my point. <coughs> <coughs> But uh, for our uh, hadrons, uh, we do not see any strong kinematical dependencies. So just uh, let's have a look in more detail. It's just example of uh, 3D binning for pi minus. <coughs> so and from uh, this picture, it's a clear scene with uh, <coughs> This uh, non-zero symmetries and uh, rising behavior are going from low X region and uh, low pH per region, basically from this four, uh, this, this quadrant here. <coughs> so <coughs> and now <coughs> it's also visible with uh, when we compare our data with uh, class data. <coughs> Uh, uh, <coughs> one can see that it, uh, there is a clear trend uh, of <coughs> uh, low in uh, asymmetries from positive to negative uh, versus X Bjorken. And uh, also, <coughs> this uh, behavior <coughs> uh, it, uh, shows uh, on a Z projection, we have uh, opposite, basically, mirror behavior of uh, <coughs> asymmetries versus Z because we have a different uh, region of X. So uh, next picture, it's uh, just a Hermes compass uh, comparison. Uh, uh, with compass, we have uh, basically the uh, same kinematical region. So and uh, from this picture, one can see that we have a very consistent behavior for uh, charged pion and hadrons between compass and Hermes. So I hope I have a time to summary. <coughs> uh, so just a small remark. Uh, with such a result, uh, now Hermes published basically every asymmetries uh, in the 3D, except uh, <coughs> single uh, target uh, spin asymmetry. <coughs> uh, so main point for 
он кил дабл спин асимметрии <coughs> это новый хв 2 and 3d kinematical binning <coughs> for vision our precision in virtual photon nuclear asymmetries с дисплей новых significant dependencies versus и он печь перп это Also, K plus asymmetries are slightly positive, but uh, have no kinematical dependence. And uh, <coughs> uh, our result are well agree with uh, compass and with class, uh, despite we have a different kinematical region. Oh, actually, that's all what I would like to say. So thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Um, so we have a time for question and discussion. Um, please raise your hand um, if you have a question. Um, can you uh, go to slide um, 16 um, when you show the um, electricity metry? So you mentioned that this um, difference from the compass is because of the different x range coverage. Uh, can you um, elaborate a little bit more how um, these different X coverage affect to this um, behavior that's a turning for your wizard? Yeah, so uh, as you see, for example, uh, in the first, uh, first column, uh, we basically have a uh, our Hermes result is for low X Birkin region and uh, class result for high X region and uh, our result is positive and class result is negative. So now when you just uh, go for next uh, column for that projection, you see that uh, class result is negative, it should be and our is positive, it should be. So uh, <coughs> uh, uh, somehow if you just uh, Which is, uh, this picture is uh, not a free d binning, it's uh, just a projection of, of data. So, mm. okay, so I mean, when, when you have this um, opposite sign of behavior for um, pi minus or for the pi plus, you have this turning at the higher g. Um, so, what's driving those um, different behavior um, that I was wondering. Um, Kunar, uh, do you want to comment or? Yeah, I, I may comment. Yeah, okay. In general, these asymmetries are more difficult to interpret because mm -hmm. they include uh, or receive different contributions uh, at subleading twist. Um, there are some terms which are believed to uh, have a larger role, for instance, the, the term with the Collins function and the E uh, distribution, which might be more pronounced at higher X because it also comes with an effect of X in the expression. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and uh, actually, we know from, from the Collins effect uh, that you have opposite sign for pi plus and pi minus. So that may actually be a reflection in, in the class data why the Hermes data is at lower X and maybe is more sensitive to other contributions in this and not so much from the Collins effect. And that's mm -hmm. the reason why maybe we see a different sign there. Uh, but it's only speculation. It's very difficult to disentangle all the contributions. Mm -hmm. I see. All right, thank you. Um, any other question? Um, if not, uh, let's thank speaker again um, and we can move on to the next talk. Um, our next speaker is um, Kyle Lee. Let me try to share my screen. Yes. Um, right. if I can we'll give a screen. talk on the polarized jet presentation functions. Um, so I will give you also two minutes warning if you are behind of schedule. Uh huh. Should I start? Uh, yes, go ahead.
Well, thank you for the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And let me start with a quick apology for changing my title. I'm certainly going to start uh, keep, uh, still talk about polarized jet fragmentation functions, but I have generalized my title a little more and I'm going to tell you in general how we can use jets at the EIC to study TMD structure. And as you have heard uh, throughout the um, workshop or conference, uh, there are two different flavors of uh, TMD structures, namely TMD PDF, which describes the structure of the parton uh, inside the hadron, or TMD fragmentation functions, which describes the distribution of the hadron with respect to a uh, fragmenting parton. And if you actually uh, also consider the polarization of the hadrons and the partons involved, you actually get a slew of different TMD structures like these. Um, and you can study these using the jets. So again, the question that I would like to address is, can we use jets at the EIC to probe the, these TMD structure that I just listed below before? And here are some of the standard processes actually are, that are used um, to study these TMD structures, namely semi-inclusive DIS, Joyan, and dihadrons in E plus C minus. And as you can note, um, there are actually, for each of these processes, these are sensitive to two TMD uh, as, as simultaneously, namely single TMD PDF and had uh, fragmentation for the semi-inclusive DIS and two TMD PDFs in Zhaoyan and two TMD fragmentations in dihedron processes. And one can imagine many other processes um, that are sensitive to TMD structures that involve jets like these. And aside from the obvious benefits that we now have uh, access, we would have access to different experiments sensitive to TMD structure. Going beyond the standard processes that I just listed in the previous slide has a benefit of being more sensitive to gluon TMDs. Um, because these gluon uh, contributions come at leading order in these beyond standard model, uh, standard uh, processes. And also many of these uh, jet involved processes are sensitive to only a single TMD instead of two TMDs like the ones I showed because now you're replacing often the hadron with the jet, which doesn't uh, have a non-perturbative uh, sensitivity. So now you're more directly accessing the TMD that you are sensitive to. So I'm going to tell you briefly about three different processes that involves jets that are useful in studying TMDs. These are not exhaustive list, but um, certainly a good list of, of them. And first is the inclusive jet production. So by inclusive jet production, I mean we are inclusive over everything except the jets in the final state. And this is the factorization that involves uh, observing hadron inside the jet, the inclusive jet, where you can measure also the transverse momentum and the longitudinal momentum fraction of the hadron with respect to the uh, jet momentum and jet axis. And if you actually compare that factorization with the inclusive hadron production, you can see that these two factorizations are very similar except the last piece. And that's because all of the dynamics of the jet lives only on the final parts. That is because this parton C that's produced from the hard process, this H, is oblivious of whether uh, this parton C will eventually turn into a hadron or a jet. And after you turn into a jet, um, then you can actually peer inside this jet to look at the hadron structure, which gives you this differential uh, dependence in the longitudinal momentum and transverse momentum. So you can actually access these longitudinal and transverse momentum structure of the hadron directly by looking at this kind of processes and you have um, sensitivity to the TMD uh, fragmentations. So again, these object is actually called TMD jet fragmentation functions. And that was my original title of jet fragmentation functions. And now you can also look at the polarized TMD jet fragmentation functions, which has analogous structure to the TMD fragmentation functions. And again, I have to emphasize that 
uh, it turns out these TMD jet fragmentation functions can be related to the standard TMD fragmentation functions, which is why it's useful because you can use it to study the standard TMD fragmentation functions that we see in the standard processes. And this is just an il to illustrate the usefulness of studying these kind of objects. So you can, for instance, look at the polarizing fragmentation function and its jet fragmentation analog, which we'll call TM uh, polarizing jet fragmentation functions. So this is a dis uh, extraction of polarizing fragmentation functions from the Bell data. And here is an asymmetry you would observe using um, polarizing jet fragmentation functions in the EIC kinematics. And you can see that now, because you're only sensitive to a single TMD fragmentation functions, you can actually directly access uh, this kind of uh, differential information on, on TMD uh, frag uh, polarizing fragmentation functions. And if you compare with the extraction from the Bell data, uh, you see qualitatively why uh, it goes up and down and so forth. So for instance, if C lambda is small, then it's positive due to the opcore contribution. And when C lambda gets large, it becomes negative due to downcore. And this is not all. You can actually look at different type of uh, azimuthal asymmetries to extract different type of uh, TMD fragmentation functions. So that was the inclusive process, but you can also look at lepton jet imbalance. Um, which would now be sensitive to the TMD PDFs instead of the fragmentation functions. And once you go through uh, factorization by identifying different type of modes, then you, you reach this kind of factorization. But again, because now you have, instead of a hadron, a jet, you have replaced effectively a TMD fragmentation function on the final side with um, TMD, uh, with a Jeff function, which is completely perturbative. So this process is sensitive to a, only a single TMD. So you again have this Q curve gives more direct access to the, uh, the TMD PDF that you're observing. A uh, caveat is that you are only sensitive to uh, four TMD PDFs, not all of them, um, but you can look at these type of different asymmetries to study different types of TMD PDFs. And now we can even combine the two um, type of processes that we just talked about. We can look at the imbalance of the jet and the lepton, for instance, in the EP collisions, and then also look inside the substructure of, of, of this jet that we observe in the final state. So you're, we are kind of taking advantage of the fact that we have both beam axis and the jet axis. And so what happens is we can be sensitive to the Q curve with respect to the beam axis, which gives sensitivity to the TMD PDFs. And then we can use the jet axis to measure the displacement of the final hadron with respect to the jet, as I spoke uh, uh, discussed in the inclusive case. And that gives sensitivity to both TMD PDFs and TMD fragmentation functions. But now we are simultaneously sensitive to both. So we are sensitive to two TMD structures, just as we were in the standard processes. However, the advantage is because you are now using two axes and because each of these hadrons or, or each of these TMD structures are sensitive to different axes, um, one can have both imbalance Q perb with respect to the beam axis and the transverse momentum of the hadron with respect to the jet axis. And these two sensitivity or differential information basically decouples the, the dependence on the TMD PDF and TMD fragmentation functions. That is each of these uh, TMDs are separately sensitive and only sensitive to one of these transverse momentums. And you can have many characteristic correlation and you are actually, depending on look, which correlation you look at, a azimuthal correlation you look at, you're sensitive to different uh, types of TMD PDFs and TMD fragmentation functions. And it turns out you're sensitive to all of them. Um, 
So to illustrate this, uh, we can, for instance, look at the azimutal asymmetry, which corresponds to sense uh, one that uh, are, is sensitive to bull molders and Collins function, which are these objects. Um, and again, you have a separation of the incoming and outgoing dynamics. And because of this separation, you can even create plots like this, where you have both q perv and j perv a JT type of uh, uh, sensitivity. And depending on different uh, slices you look at, whether you look at the horizontal or vertical slices, you're only sensitive to the TMD PDFs or TMD fragmentations functions. So this is just to sort of illustrate at leading order, but this azimuthal asymmetry, for instance, the Q perp dependence only goes into the TMD PDF, um, uh, J perp goes only into the TMD fragmentations. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have not time for these questions. Um, please uh, raise your hand um, for questions and comments. Um, I don't see um, at this moment, but please um, feel free to have a discussion on the chat or um, offline. Um, thanks, thanks again for the talk, Kyle. No problem. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So we will move on to the next talk. Um, is from RB um, on the transfer spin asymmetry um, for inclusive raw production in series at Compass. Yes. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I'm trying to share. Mm -hmm. And do you see the my share now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So um, let me start by thanking the organizers for giving me the possibility to um, present our, on behalf of the Compass Collaboration, our uh, recent uh, results on transverse spin asymmetries for inclusive row zeros uh, in cities. So starting with a bit of motivation, um, as, you, uh, as you know, transverse spin asymmetries in CDs are being measured since 2005. In particular, we have measurements from um, various collaborations, Hermes, Compass, JLab on Collins asymmetries, dihedron asymmetries, and Sievers asymmetries. And those asymmetries have been measured for different hadron types, so positive negative hadrons, unidentified hadrons, but also for uh, identified hadrons, so pions, pi zeros. K plus, K minus, K zero, and, and, and protons. And um, these observables give relevant information. We have gained a lot of relevant information on the nuclear structure and on the fragmentation functions. What has uh, not been measured uh, till now are transverse spin asymmetries for vector mesons. And uh, the reason is that they are a ch challenging measurement because of uh, low statistics and the high and the high background. But still, they are uh, quite inter interesting because vector measures are spin one objects. And so they carry a lot of information, more information with them uh, with respect to uh, pseudoscalar mesons, uh, for instance. And so they give an important insight on the fragmentation uh, process. So the cross section for the uh, CDs uh, cross section for vector meson production has already been uh, being calculated. Uh, here is shown the expression, um, including two modulations. So there is the uh, the Collins modulation and the Sievers modulations, and um, these azimuthal modulations uh, depend on the on the uh, phi this phi h h uh, ang azimuthal angle, which is the azimuthal angle of the sum of the momenta uh, h1 and h2 therefore the, uh, the, the zimutal angle of what we expect to be a vector meson these asymmetries um, in particular collins asymmetries uh, collins asymmetry is uh, given by a uh, coupling between the transversity uh, tmd and a fragmentation function uh, for the collins effects whereas the sievers asymmetry gives us as information on the sievers uh, function and the uh, unpolarized uh, fragmentation function but we have also predictions from, from models, and in particular, vector mesons are expected to have opposite and smaller Collins asymmetries with respect to leading pseudoscalar mesons. This was um, a prediction made uh, in 96 by Jujewski, but then um, it is also in a more recent work uh, by Arthur 2009. And in the plots at the bottom, you can actually see 
some uh, simulations which, uh, which uh, have been done by using uh, a standalone Monte Carlo implementation of the um, quantum mechanical stream plus the P0 model, including, uh, including both the scalar mesons and uh, vector mesons. And the results are shown for fully transverse vaporized quarks, and in particular, uh, the plot on, on, on the left shows the analyzing, the coherence analyzing power for uh, raw mesons um, as function of the hadron's fractional energy ZH and as function of, as function of PT. And we have to compare uh, this, um, this uh, analyzing power with the leading analyzing power uh, in the pseudoscalar case, so with positive pions, and as you can see, they have opposite, um, opposite sign. So this is the prediction what we expect from uh, from models, and Compass has measured uh, the Collins and the Sievers asymmetries for zeros in in CDs, and uh, I will now show the preliminary uh, results here for the first time. So a uh, few words on the Compass experiment. The Compass experiment is a fixed target experiment at the CERN uh, SPS, and it um, it uh, takes data since two thousand two. Uh, it the experimental program is quite uh, quite broad: uh, muon, muon, hadron beam, spectroscopy, Primakov, CDs, DVCS, polarized Lillian. And I would like to to bring your attention on our um, twenty uh, on our CDs uh, run on polarized neutron that uh, we will start in this uh, year, hopefully. And uh, thanks to um, the high energy beam that we have. Uh, we have a bro quite broad kinematic range, as you can see from uh, the, this uh, x u square uh, scatter plot. So, going to the uh, now to the data to the analysis, let me start with the selection of, of uh, row zeros. For this analysis, we have used the full 2010 compass data set collected with transverse polarized protons, uh, so an NH3 uh, target. And we have made, uh, we have applied some uh, cuts for the DS selection cut listed here. Uh, and uh, some cuts for the uh, for the hadron hadron selection, fractional energy and and transverse momentum, and then starting from the one hadron samples, we have built samples for hadron pairs of so H plus H minus, but also like sign pairs H plus H plus and H minus H minus H minus, and on the hadron pair uh, sample we have applied some uh, other uh, cuts, for instance, uh, like a cut on the missing energy larger than than uh, three GeV in order to um, to uh, exclude the uh, exclusive uh, peak at uh, missing energy equal to zero, as you can see from the plot here, and then um, a cut on the fractional energy of the uh, of the pair Z uh, larger than 0.3 in order to enhance the signal, the row zero signal, and smaller than uh, 0.95 just to define uh, better the, the interval. Then we have a cut on the transverse momentum of the H, uh, of the of the pair, uh, and then. Um, here is given the, um, the invariant mass range that we, um, we study. And um, the, yes, and this is the, uh, the invariant mass distribution that we, uh, that we have after all cuts. It is uh, uh, the field uh, histogram. You can see uh, the row zero peak, the F zero peak, and the F uh, two peak. And you can see also how large is the background, background under, the, uh, under the row zero, uh, the row zero peak. So this means that um, in order to extract the, uh, the transverse finesse symmetries for row zeros, we need a recipe. And the recipe that we have uh, applied is uh, shown in uh, this slide. So we apply several steps for the extraction of transverse finesse symmetries for row zeros. We start by measuring the, uh, the asymmetry for H plus H minus pairs in the variant mass region of the row zero, this um, small AUT um, symbol. Then we evaluate the row zero fraction in the invariant mass uh, region of the row zero uh, called FS. And then afterwards, we measure the background transverse spin asymmetry in the side regions. So we need to define these side regions. And at the end, we subtract the uh, background asymmetry from uh, the asymmetry that we have measured in the row zero major region in order to obtain the final transverse spin asymmetry for row zeros, both for Collins and for Sieber. So. Let me start by uh, discussing the first point. Um, in order to, for the extraction of the, uh, of the symmetries, we have used standard compass uh, methods, uh, in particular events with vertices in the, in, uh, the three uh, target cells with opposite polarizations are uh, combined in order to minimize systematic effects. 
and the asymmetries are extracted for each of, of uh, the 12, 12 periods of data taking and then combined. And this has been done, has been done for uh, six beans in X, in Z, and in uh, transit momentum, and in four beans in the invariant mass region, which you can read uh, here. And they are also shown in the, uh, in the plot. So in particular, the second, um, second invariant mass region, so region two, is the region where uh, we have the row zero, row zero signal. And then the regions one and three are the left and right send, send band regions respectively, where we will take our uh, background um, asymmetry. So um, uh, going to the extraction of the actual asymmetry, uh, what you see here is the, uh, is the asymmetry in the row zero uh, invariant mass region for H plus H minus pairs as function of X, as function of Z, and as function of PT. And as you can see, there is an indication for a positive Collins uh, asymmetry in particular at uh, intermediate Z and at small, at small PT. And this is confirmed also when we look uh, at the asymmetries in the different mass regions. So this plot, uh, the second row shows the point that I was um, uh, that uh, you saw in the first slide. In addition, we have included also some um, the dependence on the on some invariant mass beams, and the same we have done uh, for the left side band regions, so first row, and the right side band regions, uh, third row, and then also for the fourth uh, uh, invariant mass region. And here you can see that in regions one and three, the asymmetry is compatible with zero, and then in the row zero region, we see something uh, something uh, positive. And in, in addition, uh, asymmetries in one, region one and region three are uh, similar and compatible with, uh, with zero. So the next step was the, uh, is the evaluation of the row zero fraction in the invariant mass region uh, of, uh, of row zeros. And um, to do this, we tried uh, many, different, uh, many different tests. And at the end, we take the, um, the shape of the background distribution uh, from the uh, H plus H plus plus H minus H minus distribution. So looking at the, at the plot here, you can see the, uh, the black histogram, which is the total H plus H minus uh, distribution. And then the background histogram, uh, the, um, the, red, uh, the red points, which, which has been normalized in some invariant mass regions around 0.5 and then has been rescaled uh, and then subtracted from the uh, H plus H plus H minus distribution in order to get the signal distribution. And you can see here uh, the row zero, F zero and F two uh, and F two peaks. Actually the signal distribution uh, agrees, um, uh, agrees with uh, a fit with three bright signal distributions, one for without, uh, without background, uh, background term. And uh, once we have the signal distribution, we, uh, we calculate the signal fraction just my, by uh, dividing the number of, uh, of row zero uh, signal events in, um, in, the, uh, in region two, uh, dividing this number by the, uh, the number of H plus H minus uh, events. So this is an empirical method and we have applied uh, it for all X, Z and PT beans as for the asymmetries. And you can show the full procedure uh, here. So uh, what we did, um, we repeated this procedure for in all X beans, the first row, uh, Z beans, second row, and PT beans, the third row. And this is uh, the final result that we get for the signal fraction as function of X, of Z, and of PT. As you can see, the signal fraction is about 18%. Uh, 18%. Uh, you can uh, looking at, uh, at X. Uh, instead, as function of Z, it arises. Um, and this, uh, this rise is actually expected from, uh, for instance, from strict fragmentation, uh, from the string fragmentation model. At large Z, um, the signal fraction arises up to 38%. Uh, so at this point, um, uh, the two steps that we applied, uh, as I uh, already said before, is to measure the background transverse spin asymmetry in the side, in the left and right side regions, and then to subtract uh, this asymmetry from a signal uh, asymmetry, from the asymmetry in the row zero region. And um, the background asymmetry in, in the left region is shown in the first plot with, uh, uh, with uh, full markers. In the right region, it is, so, uh, are the, uh, is represented by the open markers, so a function of Z, X, Z, and, um, and PT. And for the background asymmetry, we take the arithmetic mean of these two regions in order to treat them in the same, in the same way. 
the lower plot here uh, shows the uh, contribution of the um, of the background asymmetry, uh, namely one minus the signal fraction time, times the background asymmetry, uh, to, to the total um, to the total uh, asymmetry. So next step is um, to extract from the uh, from the um, asymmetry. Uh, in the error zero region, with, which is shown again here in the upper plot, we extract the background asymmetry by taking into account the signal fraction, and we get uh, the final row zero uh, asymmetry shown uh, in the red box as, fu as function of x, of z, and of uh, pt. And One minute. So, okay, thanks. And we have an indication for a positive asymmetry, and it is large as small uh, as small pt. Okay. And uh, comparing uh, with uh, the Collins asymmetry for uh, for pions, in particular for positive pions, as measured by the compass, we see that they have uh, opposite uh, opposite uh, sign, as we expected from models. And uh, if we compare with the pi zero asymmetry instead, which has uh, me been measured by Hermes, uh, pi zero asymmetry is uh, compatible with zero, whereas rho zero uh, has we have, we see an indication for a positive sign. So the same uh, recipe we applied it also for the sievers uh, for the sievers asymmetry, which is shown in this plot again as function of x, z, p, t, and invariant mass, and also uh, um, for for the left side region first row, uh, the row zero region second row, and then the uh, right side region, which is the third the third row. So here, as you can see, the effects are uh, are lar uh, the effect is large in the row zero region, but the background asymmetry is also um, large in the sideband regions and compatible. So applying the same uh, procedure as for the Collins, um, I show again on the top left uh, plot um, the, uh, the background asymmetry in the left uh, side region with field uh, uh, closed markers and in the right side region with open markers. And uh, top right plot is the contribution of the background asymmetry to the uh, to the asymmetry in the in the row zero uh, region. So as you can see, it uh, it is large and not negligible. And finally, we subtract uh, the uh, background asymmetry uh, from the what we measured in the row zero region, and we get the fi the final Stevers uh, asymmetry, which is shown in the red box again as function of x of z and of and of pt. Error bars are large, but still we see an indication for a positive asymmetry. And if we compare uh, with, with what has been um, measured uh, for pi zeros by Hermes, we see that uh, both rho zero and pi zeros have the same uh, have a positive uh, positive sign as uh, X expected. And this brings me to the uh, to the conclusion. So, in Compass, we have measured the Collins and Sievers asymmetries for inclusively produced uh, rho zeros. And we see an indication for a positive Collins asymmetry for rho zeros opposite to the asymmetry for, uh, for positive pions as expected from models, and also indication for a positive uh, serious asymmetry, which is also uh, as expected. And this is all from my side, so thank you for, for listening. Thank you. Um, now I open for the discussion, uh, Gunnar. Yeah, very nice talk, actually, and nice results. I have a question, maybe it's more even to, I think Marco Aditi is still around, um, about the formulas of extracting these asymmetries. Um, you say you subtract the sidebands uh, from the events or the asymmetry uh, in, under the peak. Now, I understand that under the peak, you don't only have the contribution from what you may measure in the sidebands, the S, maybe the S based contributions. Uh, you have the row contribution, but you also have the interference of the two. So I actually wonder whether it's not a, a better approach to use the, just the two hard on approach and how somehow isolate the row from the two hard on fragmentation function. I don't know whether this is possible. Maybe Marco but, can comment but, uh, on that. Yeah, we are we are looking at different uh, quantities here because uh, here we look. Uh, at a um, different angle with respect to the two hadron one, right? But I think you can still, you also have for the two hadron, you have the transverse momentum dependence and you can look at, uh, not at the phi r, I think it is often used, but you can also use 
the phi h, the sum of the two hadrons, but with transverse momentum of it. So normally for the dihedron, we look at the collinear case uh, because it's so nice to use the collinear fragmentation function extra transversity, but actually it does depend on transverse momentum as well. Uh, if you write down the full expression yeah. and you can look at the transverse momentum dependence and uh, basically look at the modulation there. Um, but I would have to dig out now the, the, the papers and look at the formulas. Um, but I, I, I just don't understand how one, um, how one discriminates between the interference effects under the peak of, uh, and just the pure row contribution from under the peak, if you only subtract the sidebands. Yeah, I, 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 I see your point. Yeah, because the interference of the two could also produce an asymmetry, I, I would suppose. Uh, well, yes, there is uh, some also some interference uh, effect. But I don't know how large how large it is actually, uh, it, if if it is sizable or or not. Mm. So Maybe we should probably else. continue this question in the chat or offline um, for the keeping the schedule. But thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, so we now move on to the uh, next talk. Um, I think the next talk is from Stefan. On, um... Yes, hello everybody, can you see the screen? Yes, I can hear you and see the screen. Okay, so I will talk about multidimensional high precision measurements of cities pion beam spin asymmetry from the proton over a wide range of kinematics with class 12. So let's start with a short introduction. We have already seen some talks about this today, but we all know that the 3D nuclear structure and momentum space can be well described by TMD and the semi-inclusive deep inelastic scattering provides us a very effective tool to probe the transverse momentum dependent partonic structure within the nucleon. And when we start with a look on the cities cross section for an unpolarized target, which is displayed in here, we can see that it depends on several model independent structure functions, FUU and FLU, and on the angle phi between the electron scattering plane and the hadron production plane, according to the Trento convention. And the focus of this study will be on the polarized FLU sine phi structure function. And when we have a closer look in this structure function, we can see down here how it can be expressed in terms of TMDs and fragmentation functions then we can see that it's a convolution of four TMDs shown in red and four fragmentation functions shown in blue. And we can see each term contains either a twist three TMD or a twist three fragmentation function. So in total, it's a twist three property. And the results of this study can be nicely used in global fits to further constrain these involved TMDs and fragmentation functions. So the measurements I will present have been done with a class 12 detector in hall B at Jefferson Lab. You can see here a schematic drawing of class 12 and in the right side, a real picture of class 12 where the forward detector has moved apart from the central detector. Now, if you're interested in more details, I can refer you to this recent publication on the detector setup. And the data was recorded with class 12 during the fall of 2018, where we had a 10.6 GV electron beam with 86.3% average polarization interacting with the liquid hydrogen target. And the analyzed data, which I present, is only around 15% of the approved run group A beam time. So in the future, we will get the significantly higher statistics. Let's continue with the particle ID and the kinematic cuts. So our electron ID is mainly based on the electromagnetic calorimeter and the Schrenkhoff counters, while the hadron identification is based on the beta versus momentum correlation from the time of flight system, which you can see here in the right plot for the example of positive hadrons, where we can nicely see the pion, kaon, and proton bands. For the kinematic cuts, we require that the pion momentum is between 1.25 and 5 GeV y has to be less than 0.75 and to select the DIS region, we place a cut on Q square larger 1 GV square and W larger 2 GV. 
In addition, we require a cut on the EPIX missing mass to remove exclusive events where we request that the missing mass is larger than 1.5 GV to be in the CITES region. And for one-dimensional studies, we also require that C is larger than 0.3 to remove the target fragmentation region. Then let's come to the observables. The goal of the study, as I already mentioned, is to extract the structure function ratio FLU sine phi over FUU from single pion beam spin asymmetry. And to define the beam spin asymmetry, we first write the cross section in a bit different way by substituting the terms in front of the phi dependence by the three moments. AUU cos phi, AU cos 2 phi, and ALU sine phi. And by doing this, we can nicely define the beam spin asymmetry which is the cross-section difference between positive and negative helicity divided by the total cross-section, which leads us to this expression here, where we can nicely see that the leading term is given by ALU sine phi times sine phi. And this moment ALU sine phi can be directly correlated to our structure function ratio FLU sine phi over FUU by just the kinematic factor. So experimentally, the beam spin asymmetry is defined as one over the beam polarization times the number of counts with positive felicity minus the number of counts with negative felicity divided by the total number of counts in a specific bin. And as an example, I've shown here for pi plus the beam spin asymmetry as a function of phi in two fully multidimensional bins. The first bin is at a low Q square of around two GV square and the second bin at a high Q square of around 6.5 GV square. And as you can see in both cases, it can be nicely described by a sinoid shape. And to come to the first one dimensional, first two one dimensional measurements. So such measurements have been done with several experiments before like the old class detector, but also Hermes and Compass. And to compare the kinematic coverage and the statistics, I have shown here FLU sine phi over FUU as a function of X Bjorken in the first panel, as a function of C in the second panel, and as a function of PT in the third panel. The recent class 12 measurement is shown in black, the old class data in red, the Hermes data in blue, and the compass data in green triangles. So as you can see, while Hermes and Compass focus mainly on the low X region, class and class 12 extend this region to the valence quark regime. And if we compare the C and PT plots, we can directly nicely compare the statistical uncertainty, where we can see that with class 12, we can reach a significantly higher uh, accuracy and uh, the error bars nearly disappear, even we have much more bins than the other experiments. And as a focus of this study will be a fully multidimensional study in four dimensions. So in Q square, X Bjorken, C and PT. And to do this multidimensional binning, we first have to define the binning scheme. And therefore, we start with the electronic side and have a look on Q square versus X Bjorken, which is shown on the left side. And within this correlation, we define nine bins from one to nine, where nine is low Q squared, X, where one is low Q squared X, up to nine, where we have the highest Q squared X values. And when we now uh, go to the Hadronic side where we have the CPT correlation. We define up to seven times seven bins in CPT for each Q square X Bjorken bin, which you can see here for the example of bin one. And in total, we get 344 bins times 12 bins in phi, which gives us more than 4,000 beam spin asymmetry bins. And in the following slides, I will compare the data to three different TMD-based models. The model one and two I will show are for Mao and Lu, which were published 2013, 2014. In this model, the proton is described as an active quark plus spectator scalar and axial vector D quarks. And the difference between the two models is that they use different propagators for the axial vector D quark and different masses for these correlations. And both models include the EH1 perp and the GPERP D1 terms to describe FLU sine phi. Model three is from Bastami, Tetskin, Pokudin, and Schweitzer. And this model only uses the EH1 perp term. And here E of X is based on the Shiral Quark Soliton model. And therefore, it's the only model which is predicting the experimentally not measurable delta X contribution which is expected by QCD within E of X and which can be related to the pion nucleon sigma terms. 
So let's come to the C dependence for Pi plus. And here we can now see in this plot FLU sine phi over FUU as a function of C for the di for different multidimensional bins. So the different rows represents different X Q square bins. We start in the lowest row with X Q square bin one at low X and low Q square up to uh, the upper row where we have bin nine, which are the highest X and Q square values. And as the different columns show different PT regions, the first column is the low PT of 0.15. Then we have a medium PT up to a high PT of around 0.6 in the last column. And you can nicely see the experimental data as black points and the models as colored lines. Model one is blue, model two is red, and model three is green. And for model one and two, we also see the different contributions. The EH1 perp term is marked by the long dashed line, and G perp D1 is marked by the short dashed line. So when we have a look, we can nicely see that at small PT, things are relatively flat. We have only a slight increase with C independent of the XQ square bin. But when we go uh, to a higher PT values, then we see the increase gets a bit steeper. And especially when we go to the high uh, Q square X region here in bin nine and high PT, then we get a steep increase with C. And to do a better comparison with the theoretical predictions, I've zoomed here in four selected bins. The lower row is low Q square. The upper row is the high Q square, high X region. And when we compare these different plots, we can nicely see that the best overall description is provided by the red line, which describes model two, while the others do not agree in some bins. And when we now focus on model two, we can also look into the different contributions. And here we nicely see at low Q square, the main contribution is coming from the EH1 perp term while the G perp D1 term is close to zero, while at a high, in the high Q square region, both contributions, so also the G perp D1 term is needed to give a more realistic description of the data. Then as a next step, I want to come to the PD dependence for pi plus. So here we see a very similar figure. Again, FLU sin phi over FLU as a function of PT this time. Again, for the four different bins, bin one, bin two, bin seven, and bin nine, according to this plot. And now we have different C regions, starting with a small C in the left column of 0.3 up to a high C around 0.6 in the most right column. And here we can nicely see at low Q square, low C, we have a rather flat behavior. When we increase Q square, it starts to increase a little bit. But what's more interesting is when we go to the high C region, then we can nicely see that now when we are at low Q square, we get some structures in the plots, in the FLU sine phi value. And when we go to the high Q square value, we even get some strong increase. And when we compare this to the theoretical models, we can see also here, we get the best description from the model two, which is the red line. But we can also see that uh, the models are not able to describe the structures which we see in there. So this indicates that either the TFDs or fragmentation functions which are used have to be improved, or that we have to include additional terms. Since in total, we remember there were four terms and we use only two to describe it. Then as the last point, I want to look into the pi zero and pi minus case. Here again, we start with the C dependence. On the left, we see the C dependence for pi zero. The plot is in principle identical to what I showed for pi plus. And here we can nicely see that pi zero is mostly positive. And you see it's rather flat or even decreasing a bit in some bins as a function of C. When we now go to pi minus on the right side, we see for pi minus, this is expected classically from one dimensional plots to be negative or close to zero. And we can see here in most bins, it is negative and close to zero. But when we go especially to the low Q square region and to low PT, then we see we get some sign transitions 
and it starts to be it starts negative and then gets positive at larger z values. And to do a comparison with uh, for the different pions, I have selected here as an example bin seven, which is already high q square, high x bin. And here we can nicely see in the first row we have pi plus, which is positive and increasing. In the second row, we have pi zero, which is rather flat and increasing less than the pi plus case, but also positive. And in the lower row, we have pi minus, which is close to zero and smaller than the other two or even slightly negative. As a next case, I want to have a look into the PT dependence for pi zero and pi minus. Here we again see the PT dependence for pi zero. And also here we can nicely see pi zero is positive in all bins. And now as a, for the PT dependence, you see we have typically some increase and then a fall off later on as a sm in the small Q square region and some increase in the higher Q square region. And for pi minus, we get some very interesting effects. Here we see in the high Q square region, things are more or less flat and slightly negative as a function of PT. But when we go to the low Q square region and low X region, then we see that we get some sign transitions. So it starts positive, gets negative. And here we even, when we go to a high C value, we even get large positive values for small PT and then it gets negative for larger PTs. So this is something which we are still investigating and trying to explain. And then as the last slide, let's come to a comparison for the PT dependence for the three different pions. Now for this case, I've selected bin two, which is a, this bin at a low Q square and low X value, where we had the most interesting effects. And here we see for pi plus, we are positive. And for a high C, we already observed these structures in the pi plus distribution, in the pi plus results. If we go to pi zero, we are again positive. And we also see these peak-like structures in here, which first go up and then go down. And when we go to pi minus for the same bin, then we can see the sign transitions and here's the structure, which we see, for example, here at a high C value is very similar to what we also had for the pi plus in here. And yeah, then let's come to a conclusion and an outlook. So we have seen that class 12 enables the extraction of Citus pion beam spin symmetry moments with high accuracy in an extended kinematic range and a fully differential binning in Q square X Bjorken C and PT has been performed with a high precision extraction of the beam spin asymmetry. And due to this high precision, the study helps to distinguish between different reaction models and also the kinematic dependence and the varying dominance of different TMD and fragmentation function terms can be identified when we compare it to theory predictions. And we have seen that the existing models, especially model two, provide an overall quite good agreement with our data. And this good agreement of model two indicates that we have an important role of axial vector dequarks in the protons wave functions. And this was the main input in this model. And uh, as a summary, we can say that the class drive citizen result will help to improve the results from global TMD fits and also provide access to so far poorly known TMDs and help to constrain them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now open for discussion. Um, please raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, Gunnar? Yeah, Stefan, thanks for a nice talk and actually very impressive in, uh, results now. It's good to see results coming out from the class 12 uh, uh, data now. Um, I have two comments, actually. Uh, one thing what bothers me always uh, with the theory curves is they don't seem to have an uncertainty band, so it's really difficult to uh, judge at the end how much uh, tension there is between data and uh, theory. Uh, 
Do you have a feeling or they just don't provide any uh, uncertainties in these calculations? Um, yeah, for theories, it's hard to get an uncertainty band because they use published results on the different input parameters, for example, the E of X function and so on. Mm -hmm. And based on this, they do the calculation. So it's hard to get an uncertainty for this. Yeah, and then uh, I have a comment to the pi minus results. Uh, since we saw earlier, we had this nice explanation that yet is this, uh, uh, this trend where this x going to negative. And now you show us, uh, especially here at this plot, uh, these rather large positive ones. Now, what what really st uh, sticks out now, if you compare pi plus, pi zero, pi minus for this bin especially, um, they don't seem to fulfill uh, isospin symmetry relations. Um, it can be an exception here and maybe some contributions that actually violate it, but um, this would be worthwhile to check um, since you have now all three pions and with very good statistics, uh, statistical position to make also to, yeah, to check uh, how much uh, isospin is actually uh, fulfilled. And yes, that's a very good point. Yeah, this is broken. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't hear the answer, maybe. Can you hear me? Ah, yeah, yeah, I can hear now. Yeah, so I say that this is a very good point. We will check this. Okay. But very nice, very impressive. Right. Um, other question, comment? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. This is really nice to see. This is high precision data. I just have a quick question, um, simple question. Yes. So this is from the class 12. Um, and do you actually expect to have more data from the class 12? Yes, we will get more data. So we already have recorded more data, but this is still in the calibration and cooking process. So this is ongoing and we will mm -hmm. also record more data in the future for this configuration. I see, excellent. So Thank what you. we have now is only 15% of what's approved. So in the end, we expect to have, uh, let's say six, seven times more ah, of what okay. we have here. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the, this nice result and talk. Um, so we will move on to the next talk. Um, next talk is also from the class collaboration, uh, Christopher. Okay. Uh, Stefan, can you stop sharing? I can't share until, okay, thanks. Okay. All right, so first of all, let me thank the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk. I'll be talking about uh, multidimensional partial wave analysis of CETA's dihadron beam spin asymmetries at class 12. Uh, there we go. So here's the CETA's dihadron process. So um, we have a fixed proton target, polarized electron beam, and uh, exchange of a virtual photon, and out comes two hadrons. And in our case, it'll be a pi plus and a pi minus. And just like Stefan, we're measuring the beam spin asymmetry, which is the difference in cross sections for uh, positive helicity electrons and negative helicity electrons normalized by the total. And this is also sensitive to a PDF and a uh, dihadron fragmentation function in this case. Now, this uh, process actually probes spin momentum and spin spin correlations in hadronization. And it actually complements the uh, single hadron CDIS uh, results with the advantage of having another, another degree of freedom to play with. So here's the same process uh, drawn in the handbag diagram. And uh, the focus for this talk is uh, about um, this partial wave expansion. So this dihadron fragmentation function can be expanded on a basis of spherical harmonics. And uh, these spherical harmonics are enumerated by angular momentum eigenvalues uh, given by L comma M. And the goal here is to explore dihadron fragmentation depending on uh, different relative angular momentum. So for example, we can have an S wave interfering with P wave. So S wave would be unpolarized and a P wave could have uh, transverse or longitudinal polarization components. Now, 
At twist two, this beam spin asymmetry is sensitive to F1, which is the unpolarized PDF that everyone knows, and G1 perp, which is the uh, dihadron fragmentation function, which is uh, dependent on the longitudinal polarization of the fragmenting quark. And uh, this has been measured for the first time at class, and, and it's been appeared on PRL actually a few days ago. And this is the asymmetry that's uh, amplitude that's sensitive to G1 burp. And uh, here it's shown in invariant mass spins, and you can see at low invariant mass it's positive, and then right before the row mass it switches to negative here. And on the right hand side we we see the uh, Z bin or the Z dependence of this asymmetry. And the red points here are for below the row mass, and it sort of rises in Z. And the blue points are for including the row mass and above, and it's sort of flat with respect to Z. And this is actually the first time that, that we see something non-zero that's sensitive to G1 perp. In fact, there were earlier attempts to measure G1 perp, uh, both by Bell and Compass, but for reasons uh, that are a bit beyond the scope of the talk, they saw things that were pretty much consistent with zero. Now, at twist three, the beam spin asymmetry is sensitive to the twist three PDF, E of X, uh, which is collinear, and uh, H1 perp or H1 angle. And uh, this H1 is a dihadron fragmentation function, which is dependent on the uh, transverse spin of the fragmenting quark. And uh, this also goes along with the, the previous slide's measurement. Um, this is the X dependence of the relevant asymmetry, which looks sort of flat. And then uh, if you take extractions of H1 angle, um, specifically the SP interference term, uh, this extraction came from E plus C minus data from Bell. You can see the invariant mass dependence and the Z dependence here. If you take this with the measurement, given by the class uh, measurement, together it gives you the ability to do a point by point extraction of the twist three PDF E of X. And I think there are already some very preliminary results out for that. Now again, twist two, sensitive G1 perp, uh, that's a helicity dependent fragmentation. And then twist three is H1, which is transverse spin dependent fragmentation. And our goal here is to extend these previous measurements, providing a precise disentanglement of the partial waves. So let's talk about partial waves. So at L equals zero, we have SS interference, which is just unpolarized, unpolarized, uh, zero comma zero, that's the only one. At L equals one, we have SP interference. So we can have unpolarized longitudinal, which is at M equals zero, or unpolarized transverse, which is at M equals plus or minus one. And then at L equals two, we have PP interference. So either transverse or longitudinal, and you can, can read off what those are as well. We have five partial waves at that level. And then these are the names given to all the uh, dihadron fragmentation functions. Um, the subscripts basically adopt the uh, notation here with, um, uh, should note that U becomes O in the notation. So let me focus on the G1 perp series for a moment. The ones in the middle column or M equals zero, these all vanish. So they're just zero and we can forget about them. And then there's a symmetry relation here where the ones at negative M equal the ones at positive M. So the ones connected by arrows are equivalent. So when we perform any fit to partial waves, we only really have to care about three of them here, one comma one, two comma one, and two comma two. On at twist three, um, well, this is a twist two diff, but our twist three uh, terms in the beam spin asymmetry gives us access to the H1 series. We actually have to care about all nine of them here. And uh, there's a difference in notation here. The ones to the left of the black line are called H1 perp, and that indicates a correlation with the transverse momentum of the fragmenting quark. And then the ones to the right of the, the line are called H1 angle, and that's a correlation with the relative uh, momentum of the hadrons, the pions. Now again, focusing on this middle column, the M equals zero column, it turns out that this one up at the top and here at the bottom are actually highly correlated. So when we do a fit, their error bars are much larger than the rest. And then the one here in the middle at L equals one, this one's actually suppressed by our phase space, unfortunately. So this whole column, when we perform the fit, we actually get large uncertainties for these M equals zero term. Nevertheless, we need to include them in any fit. So we have uh, nine partial waves total to fit here. So just recapping at twist two, we just have three to fit. And when I show the asymmetries, um, I'm gonna show them in a figure that it reflects this shape. And then at twist three, we have all nine of these and we do a full simultaneous fit, which is actually 12 
uh, amplitudes total. Um, when I show the figures, I'm not going to include the sem equals zero column simply because the error bars are enormous, but again, we do include it in the fit. So the figures at twist three are going to look something like this instead. Uh, and also, the, again, the bell extraction was uh, focused on this one, come along partial wave. Okay, so now turning to the experiment. Um, Stefan just mentioned this, but again, uh, this is the stun that uh, Jefferson Lab class 12 with longitudinally polarized electron beam uh, scattering on an unpolarized liquid hydrogen fixed target. Beam energy was about 10.6 GeV and polarization ranged from about 86 to 89%. The uh, event selection criteria are given here. So I'm focusing on the pi plus by minus Cetus production uh, with the cuts uh, Q greater than one GeV, W greater than two GeV and Y less than 0.8. Some cuts on the dihadron are a Z is less than 0.95. And uh, similar to Stefan, we have a uh, missing mass cut greater than 1.5 GeV. Then we have pion cuts uh, XF greater than zero to get us toward the uh, current fragmentation region. And then a minim minimum momentum on the pions of 1.25 GeV to get away from port tracking region. And finally, we also have fiducial PID and vertex cuts. So here's our... Uh, Kinematics distributions. So on the left is uh, Q squared versus X. And you can see Q squared spans from about 1 GeV squared to 10 GeV squared. X goes from about 0.1 to 0.7. And on the right here is our invariant mass distribution. And you can see that there's a, a row peak right here at about 0.77. And the uh, existence of this row peak actually motivates a multidimensional binning scheme where several of our asymmetries will be uh, plotted in three different regions of invariant mass. So we have below, around, and above the row mass. And uh, so I'll be showing uh, bins in Z in these three invariant mass regions. So here I show the Z versus uh, MH correlation. And then same thing for PT in these three invariant mass regions. And then if you're curious, here's what PT and Z correlation looks like. And then finally, uh, the dihadron process is uh, given by three angles. So two of them are azimuthal angles. Uh, they're called phi H and phi R. And then we have a sort of polar angle in the rest frame of the dihadrons, which is called theta. It's not too important what the definitions of, of these are, but our modulations are written as formulas of these three angles, and they're given here explicitly. And a priori, these are this represent sort of an orthogonal set um, with some caveats. So what is more important though, is uh, our coverage. So here's our azimuthal uh, correlations. So phi H versus phi R shown here, and here's what theta looks like. And uh, since the ranges are sort of limited and uneven, um, this actually impacts the orthogonality of our modulations and causes the amplitudes to become linearly dependent on each other. Therefore, we need to do a simultaneous fit to all our 12 partial wave uh, amplitudes. And we do this with an unbin maximum likelihood method. And we use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo as our optimizer. And the Markov chain is uh, driven by a Metropolis Hastings uh, sampler. And that samples a posterior distribution. Um, and we give it a flat prior with initial values at zero. OK, so now turning to the asymmetry measurements, I'm going to first go through the twist two ones, which are again sensitive to G1 perp. That's our uh, longitudinal spin dependent dihadron fragmentation function. Um, first up is the invariant mass dependence. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, I label the uh, partial waves. And in the upper right corner, I label the, uh, the relevant dihadron fragmentation function. And um, this one here, the 1, 1, is the one that you can sort of qualitatively compare to the, the uh, PRL measurement here. So we see the sign change, just as before in the PRL. I should note that in the uh, measurements that I'm showing today, these updated ones, I, I included about uh, a factor of two more data in this one. So, um, and also the PRL measurements, uh, since they didn't do the partial wave expansion, it actually integrates over theta or rather sums over L. So sum over a column. And the uh, depolarization factor, um, the kinematic factor was not divided out in the PRL results, but they are now in, the, uh, in these new results. So really um, these partial wave analysis is actually refinement of the PRL me measurement is one way to look at it. But qualitatively, at least you can compare that we still see the same sort of structure between the two. In the two comma two partial wave, we see this uh, nice enhancement around the rho mass. And well, rho mass on is spin one, so it'll give us a P wave pi plus pi minus, and uh, two comma two is PP interference. 
Okay, so now moving on to the z-dependence. So again, I'm doing z-dependence in three invariant mass regions. So red circles is below the row mass, green triangles is around the row mass, and then blue downward triangles is above the row mass. And you can see what the uh, z-dependence in each of these three regions looks like. And it's relatively flat. Um, for example, the, uh, the region around the row mass and above the row mass for this one comma one range is, is uh, fairly similar. Um, and then our two comma two partial wave, again, our uh, green points here are higher simply because of that row peak enhancement that I showed in the previous slide. And then finally, I show the PT dependence, uh, which um, has similar trends. But one thing to take away here is that higher PT, tend, tend, we tend to have higher amplitudes, especially for the higher invariant mass regions. OK, now I'm going to switch gears to twist 3, which is uh, the one sensitive to the H1 diffs. Um, that's our transverse spin dependent fragmentation. And uh, first up is the X dependence. And uh, we look at X dependence simply because one of the original goals was to extract E of X. So we have Bell giving us uh, H1 angle OT. And uh, we can use that to get point by point extraction of E of X here. Um, we can also take a look at the 2 comma 2 partial wave, which shows some significant here, and that's uh, E of X with H1 TT. Um, this one comma one, again, is the one that you can compare to the PRL result, although only qualitatively for the aforementioned region reasons. And also we see hints in uh, one comma minus one and two comma minus two, we see hints of non-zero H1 per. Okay, next up is the invariant mass de dependence. And uh, here we see a, a rise in the invariant mass in our one comma one partial wave. And then similar to the twist two, uh, we, in, our, our, in our L equals two amplitudes uh, with positive M, we actually see these enhancements around the row peak again. We don't see them in the negative side for some reason. Um, and then the last thing I want to show here is the Z dependence. And again, we, we do this in the three invariant mass regions. And uh, here in the, um, the, uh, the row peak region and above the row peak region, we see it's sort of flat with respect to Z. It's actually more or less flat um, in the low invariant mass region too, but uh, it's significant for uh, higher invariant mass. And uh, if I just take away the, uh, the blue and the, the red regions and just focus on the region around the row mass, the green points, um, you can see our hints for a larger H1 perp that I mentioned earlier are, are sort of, um, are, they're more prominent in the uh, region around the row mass here and here, especially for here at high Z. And finally, there's this weird point here um, in our two comma one partial wave, which is sort of out to lunch over here. Um, that's something we're probably gonna have to investigate more to make sure, uh, I'm not sure if that's real or not, but, Anyway, that brings us to the conclusion. So once again, these CETUS uh, dihadron beep spin asymmetries are sensitive to dihadron fragmentation functions, G1 perp, H1 perp, and H1 angle, and our twist three parton distribution function, E of X. And uh, this partial wave expansion provides uh, dependence on dihadron polarizations. It refines our access to, to G1 perp, and it gives us a better understanding of H1 angle, and it also hints at non-zero H1 perp. Yeah. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, now, um, anyone have a question? Please raise your hand. Waiting a few more seconds. Ah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for the, for the talk. Um, just a question about the, this, this new data you've shown plot on slide 17. They look a bit um, a bit bigger than what you had in, in, the, um, in, in the PRL. Is it because of the, this normalization you mentioned or something else? I think, uh, um, actually, Timothy and I looked at this. He's a, another author on this. I think the depolarization factor sort of changed things. OK. Um, and also because, again, this, this uh, this PRL result integrated over theta. So but yeah, we, we've cross-checked this thing like crazy and it, it comes down to those two things, so. Okay, so, so what, what should I use? Um, they, they, are, they are not independent sets, right? So I should use one or the other, not the two of them if I want to use them, right? Yeah. 
yeah if you use the PRR one then then um the, the corrected ones yes I, I got them yeah okay yeah okay so I cannot use the two of them of course yeah okay thank you All right, um, any other question? Not, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you. And now moving on to the next talk. Uh, next talk is by Kiara. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you see my slides? I think it's coming up, not yet. Ah, I see your screen now. Okay, is it a screen? It is not. So maybe. Now it's full screen. Now it's full screen, okay. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And uh, today my talk will be about uh, transverse momentum dependent distributions uh, in semi-inclusive DIS. And in particular, I'll talk about um, predictions for the electron ion collider and the impact that uh, EAC data will have uh, on TMD's extractions. Uh, so I guess uh, TMD don't need an introduction for this audience, but I'd just like to, um, to put it the, the, some of their features, uh, for example, their relation to GPDs and PDFs. Uh, so team, these are uh, three-dimensional maps of hadrons in momentum space, and uh, you know once we define the longitudinal direction, then team, these are functions of x, the momentum fractions carried by the quark, and the transverse momentum of the part uh, kt. And uh, once you integrate CMDs over the momentum in the momentum space, then you get uh, linear distributions, uh, parting distribution. And um, okay, so for example, uh, we can write a TMD, uh, we can write the uh, unpolarized TMD uh, like this. And the point of uh, showing the, you this formula is, um, is, to, uh, is to remind that in TMDs, there are some elements that can be uh, calculable in a perturbative way. Uh, so by doing a perturbative expansion in, in alpha S and there are the, the reddish brown in the, the, the one highlighted here in, with the reddish brown uh, squares. Uh, the matching to the, the matching coefficient to the collinear region and the pseudo the pseudo form factor. Then in TMDs there is there are uh, there is also an, an input from uh, for the non longitudinal non perturbative part uh, which are uh, the collinear PDFs and then uh, there is um, there is a non perturbative transverse content so this is there is this FMP in this case. Uh, that has to be parameterized and, and fitted to data. Uh, so for TMDs, we do know uh, the, the inputs from, uh, from experiments and uh, one of the, ex the processes that can get us information about TMDs uh, is semi inclusive DIS, as is be, uh, has been uh, widely, said in these, widely said in these sessions and these days. Uh, so in, in semi inclusive DIS, you, have, uh, you detect an outgoing hadron and uh, once you integrate on uh, phi s and phi h, uh, the two azimuthal angles shown, shown here, uh, in, in the kinematic limits so where the mass of the target and the, uh, the transverse momentum uh, of the outgoing header are much smaller than the scale of the process. Uh, for in the, in the unpolarized case, then you can write the uh, CD's cross section uh, in terms uh, as proportional to the structure function uh, FUUT. Uh, which in turn can be written as a convolution of the unpolarized uh, TMD PDF uh, F1, and, and then the, the fragmenting quark gives us information about uh, the TMD fragmentation function uh, D1, the unpolarized one. Okay, so uh, so the this talk will be about uh, this, these two uh, TMDs, and the results uh, that I show uh, in this talk are based on the on the extraction uh, of TMDs done by the Pavia group in 2017, which has been published uh, in, in this article, and uh, uh, which is a, a global feed. Uh, uh, consider uh, simultaneously some inclusive DIS, Dralian, and Z boson production data uh, for, for a total of points of uh, more than 8,000. And uh, the non perturbative uh, transverse content in this, uh, in this analysis uh, was parameterized uh, uh, as shown in this formula. So, um, uh, so we had uh, for, for F1 and PM for D1 and P, uh, sum of uh, Gaussian and uh, weighted Gaussians uh, with, with, uh, with some coefficient uh, depending on the transverse momentum. 
And then we, we have a non-trivial X dependence uh, uh, for a total uh, of 11 uh, free parameters, uh, which, are, which are the ones uh, highlighted here in yellow. And this, is an, this, is a, this analysis is, is uh, flavor independent. Okay, so uh, as I was mentioning uh, at the start of my talk, um, uh, we performed some, uh, some impact studies to see uh, what will be the impact of new data coming from the electron ion collider on, uh, on these um, extractions of uh, unpolarized TMDs. And so the starting point uh, of, uh, of our study are the EAC uh, pseudo data, which uh, have been um, produced, so are available for uh, the final, uh, for all the, uh, the four, for, for the four uh, final state hadrons. But uh, so for our studies, we used only pi, and so we consider only pi plus and pi minus. Uh, then we consider all the five config energy configuration uh, in which the EAC is supposed uh, to run. Uh, the end, um, the, the most important part of, uh, of impact studies are uh, the uncertainties uh, and uh, in particular, and we took into account uh, both the uncorrelated uncertainties and, and the correlated ones. So the normalization errors that, uh, that come with uh, the pseudo data. Uh, the starting point uh, to start our study, uh, we chose as, uh, as the observable um, we chose to, to consider as observable a few UT uh, to which the cross section of sim inclusive DIS is proportional, and, and we proceeded in this way. So, starting from uh, PV17, the PV17 extraction that uh, constitutes our theoretical knowledge uh, of, of TMDs, then we produced uh, predictions uh, in, the, in the pneumatical points uh, of the uh, pseudo data. Uh, we produced we produce prediction for FUUT, and then we assign to uh, such uh, predictions uh, uncertainties coming from uh, the EAC uh, pseudo data. And this is just to mention that this analysis has been done using uh, Apple Plus Plus like, uh, like, uh, as, a lab, uh, as a library and has been performed in, using also Nanga Parvat, which uh, is a C++ suite of tools that we developed uh, for, for TMD analysis. And both of these codes are, are publicly available. So the first step of our impact study has been this, uh, the uh, computation of uh, so-called sensitivity coefficients. Uh, which, uh, which are, for example, have, for example, being used in, in this article. Uh, so here you see the formula uh, to compute uh, such coefficients. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, as the observable, we chose uh, the structure function uh, FUUT, uh, while uh, for the distribution for which to compute uh, this coefficient, we chose uh, the uh, TMD parameters from the PV17 extraction. Uh, so PV17 has uh, 200 replicas uh, available, uh, and this is the, the regular formula, the, the usual formula to compute uh, an average of uh, an observable using uh, Monte Carlo uh, replicas. At the denominator here, then you see this, this factor, this coefficient uh, xi, uh, which is the ratio of the experimental uncertainty in this, in this case uh, coming from the pseudo data and the theoretical uncertainty. And what happens is that uh, the theoretical uncertainty cancels in the denominator, uh, so it doesn't really come into play uh, into this picture. Um, when we computed the, the sensitivity coefficient, then we obtained uh, plots. Uh, these, these are examples of the plots that we obtained. So uh, in, in the upper part here, uh, you see um, the plot, we plotted uh, semi, um, sensitivity coefficients uh, for the lowest um, energy configuration of the EAC. So it's square root of s equals to uh, 28 uh, GV, and uh, in in this uh, in this lower part, then there is the uh, the, the same plot, but for the highest energy configuration uh, for which the AC would be uh, would produce predictions, uh, would produce data. Uh, so you see that here we, we have access to a wider uh, area in, in kinematics, uh, and uh, as uh, as um, uh, we, we can see that uh, the impact. On TMD seems to be overall uh, biggest in case of the lower energy, um, but here we we can also see that, for example, the impact of EAC data will be uh, will be higher uh, for low X and and low Q uh, in for the low X and low Q uh, region. And this trend is uh, we can also see this trend in in this other plot where. Uh, we averaged over all the uh, over all the configuration of the EAC of all the energy configuration, 
And uh, so we, you can you can see already here that uh, we, we do expect a higher impact uh, in uh, at uh, low Q and uh, and low X. So then the, the second part uh, of our impact study has been um, uh, performing uh, a reweighting um, of our predictions. So uh, reweighting is a well-established technique to uh, to include information coming from uh, new data uh, into an existing uh, theoretical knowledge or into a, in general into an existing knowledge um, without uh, performing uh, a new fit that uh, can be um, can be expensive uh, in terms of, of time. Uh, so um, when you perform a reweighting procedure, what you do expect to see is that uh, if, for example, you have uh, a, an, accent, an uncertainty band uh, coming from uh, from the present knowledge uh, of, in this case, the unpolarized uh, TMD uh, F1. Then, when uh, after you perform the reweighting, so after you include new information coming from uh, new data, you expect to see that this uncertainty uh, is is lower. The you you expect that the demand uh, reduces, so you expect a, an effect that's uh, it's uh, approximately like this. Okay, so um, the first step uh, of the reweighting is uh, is to um, to com to compute the chi squares uh, of all replicas, uh, comparing them with uh, comparing the predictions obtained with uh, uh, the PV17 um, extraction uh, with uh, the pseudo data of the EAC. Uh, mm. And uh, and here I report I I I show here some some plot of the chi the total chi square distribution. Uh, for uh, for such for uh, some of the configurations, so we 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 of course did uh, we of course computed the chi square for all the uh, for the uh, different com combinations and configurations of the uh, EAC uh, pseudo data. So you see that uh, here we get approximately a, a chi square shape. Uh, but from this plot, you can also see one of the main challenges uh, of this uh, reweighting procedure, which is the huge number of points that we have uh, that we have to include. So, EAC is going to produce uh, thousands of data, and this has been and including the information coming from all this data uh, has been a challenge in in this uh, in this reweighting procedure. Uh, so the idea again for the reweighting is to compute the the chi squares then. Is to assign uh, ways to to each replica in in a way that uh, uh, in uh, to select uh, meaningful replicas. Uh, so what happens here is that you compute the uh, you compute the some the coefficients and uh, the, the these are the weights and the probability of a replica to be included in the new set of replicas. So the new set produced after the inclusion of the new information. Uh, the probability of a replica to be included in that is directly proportional uh, to the weight. And then at the end, after you computed the weight, the, uh, there after doing an unweighting procedure, or um, are offered or after uh, having taken into consideration the weights, uh, you uh, you recompute the observable, or in this case, you recompute the um, the uh, the TMD uncertainty bands, and uh, and you see what impact uh, the new data has uh, on, uh, on the extraction. Uh, so in the literature, there are different mathematical formulas to, uh, to uh, perform the second step of the weighting, so to compute the weight. And uh, for example, uh, one of the formula uh, he is, uh, an ex uh, is essentially an, uh, an, exponent, an exponential, and this formula has been used recently in, in this article. And uh, so, in particular, this this formula uh, suppresses a very high uh, chi square, as as uh, as we we will expect uh, to um, to select uh, the best replicas. While these other formulas, which has with these other formula, which have been proposed by the NMPDF collaboration, as this um, as this coefficient here, uh, chi square elevated to the number of points um, minus one. And um, this um, uh, and uh, so this formula uh, behaves uh, slightly differently from the previous one, and uh, in particular, this in which in with this formula you suppress uh, very high and, and very low uh, chi squares. So we we try uh, to perform we try to compute the weights and perform the weighting procedure with both formulas, and then and uh, uh, we choose to use uh, the formula proposed by the NMPDF group. 
so we use uh, these formulas where for the chi-square here, we chose to put uh, the, uh, the sum of the chi-square of the AC pseudo data plus the chi-squares of the replicas selected uh, with respect to uh, the original uh, PV17 data. Okay, so after performing the um, so after uh, after this step, we uh, computed the weight and then uh, we recomputed uh, the uncertainty bands on um, of the TMDs and uh, and we got uh, these very very preliminary plots. Uh, so the gray band here is the 68 confidence level of the previous of the PV17 uh, uh, extraction. So uh, previous to uh, include new information uh, from the AC. Uh, while the red band uh, is the uncertainty band of the, team, of the unpolarized team DF1 um, after the inclusion of, uh, uh, of the new information coming from ESC pseudo data. Um, so you can see that um, in, a, in all these three cases, um, the, the bands uh, shrink and so we have a uh, we, we can uh, effectively see that uh, the, the impact uh, that the AC will have uh, on TMDs. And um, for example, so to and to, per, to obtain these results, we, we combine pseudo data coming from different configurations. So uh, four out of the five com different configurations that uh, the AC uh, will, uh, will, uh, will have. And um, okay, so and uh, as, um, as already shown um, by the computation of the sensitivity coefficients, we, we can also see that the, the impact is expected to be higher at uh, low X and low Q. Okay, so uh, I'll come to my conclusions. And uh, which, are, uh, which are simply that the, this work is, is very much uh, in progress. So we were still, um, we we're still trying to, uh, to perform better this, this weighting procedure, but, for the, but we can for sure see, uh, say that ESC will have uh, an enormous impact uh, on TMD extractions as, as shown by these preliminary plots. And uh, uh, we can also, see that we, we kind of uh, expect EAC to have uh, a huge impact uh, because it will cover uh, an, a climatical area in the Q-square explained, which has not been covered by previous existing uh, experiments like COMPASS and uh, HERMES. And, uh, and also is uh, ESC the JLab12 uh, data are, are also coming, uh, but they will cover a completely different area. So ESC will be very, very important uh, for to um, to reduce uncertainties uh, on on TMD extractions. Okay, so um, this is this is all. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Um, so we have a few minutes for question and discussion. Uh, Carla, go ahead. Hi, Chiara. Very Hi. nice talk. Uh, just a, a curiosity. I would like to have your opinion on whether the number of replicas that you use is sufficient to um, to have a, let's say, a good representation of uncertainties. Because in the plots of the chi squares, yeah, in the chi squares profile, I see, I saw a lot of holes. I I don't know whether. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. You are correct. And and uh, so one of the weakest point of this uh, is is exactly that. So uh, this these uncertainty events that I showed are based on uh, ten to thirteen replicas out of two hundred, uh, which which I agree is not much to go on. And and this uh, I mean uh, it's very sufficient to make uh, to make a statement. And this is also why I said this is very very preliminary. And we are, we are trying to. Uh, we are, we are trying to perform better this uh, this procedure by by also so we, we tried we we tried uh, different formulas to compute the weights and um, okay so basically uh, so basically this is um, one of the motivation to exclude the the uh, the simple exponential one is that uh, basically it, it threw away too many replicas uh, to to make a significant statistical statement. No, no, I, I understand. No, I also understand that that 200 replicas comes from the original fit. So I understand that. No, am I am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Okay. Yeah, they okay, come but, from the original fit. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, other question for Kiara? Um, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. 
And we are moving on to the last talk of this session, uh, Novo. Do you see my screen? Yes. All right. All right. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to present this work. Um, so I'm going to discuss a work that it was finished last year about um, inclusion of lattice data within QCD global analysis. Um, so this was work done by all these collaborators here, and it was already published. And um, Jake from University of Melian, who was the actual driving force of this analysis. Okay, so the the paradigm in recent years in the in the jam collaboration has been to try to incorporate as many observables from experiments to be able to extract a, a wide variety of correlation functions. But recent, in recent years, we start exploring this idea of trying to combine also simultaneously uh, the lattice data as a complement. Now, depending on how you view it, you know you could view the lattice data to be a prior belief. Uh, sort of a regulators of your uh, parameter, you know, that sort of put some bounds on, on your underlying platonic structures. And then you can sort of confront this, you know, with the experimental data. And then if, if the final evidence, for instance, is totally in, a, in disagreement with your prior beliefs, then you can at least see some tension or not. But in the absence of that, at least you can uh, help to constrain especially in regions of kinematics where the experiment, well, first of all, experiment might, might not actually be reachable. Also, factorization theorem doesn't actually even work. Um, so we started doing this kind of exercise uh, some years ago uh, using lattice moments. So uh, this was a paper uh, that it was published in 2017 well, we did this exercise uh, in the context of the Collins asymmetry, uh, which is uh, list, you know, shown here. And then we included the, the lattice uh, tensile charge GT moment. Um, and uh, because there has been a, 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 maybe a potential indication that the, that, that the tensile charges in the nucleon that you can extract from the moments of transversity from, from experimental data are kind of in tension with, with lattice QCD. But we show in this analysis that in reality, we, you know, the lattice data and the experimental data can coexist quite well. And this was in some sense uh, uh, motivating because it tells, it tells us that in principle, we can play this additional game in which we can confront uh, the input from experiment and lattice all within a unified global analysis framework. Um, and actually, I, I got a lot of criticism after doing this. People were telling me not do that, you know. So there was another analysis that we finished uh, last year where we include all these single spin asymmetries. This time we didn't include any lattice data. And we finally managed to you know, bring the lattice data to uh, and the phenomenology data of tensile charges to be very, very close to each other. And so this confirms that our assertions on the previous paper was actually right. Uh, so the future of this game, in my opinion, is really to include uh, lattice information. Now, recently there has been a developments in lattice QCD where, where basically we can, exp we can explore this uh, this object called uh, of the Lycon distribute matrix elements um, that it was pioneered by Shandong Ji. And basically what you're looking at is uh, uh, correlation matrices that of course you have to renormalize it properly. Um, there are displays not on the Lycon, but it's displays around some value, you know, with respect to each quark field. Uh, depending on how you displace it, you, you have a different kind of cor correlation function, whether it goes into the pseudo, P pseudo PDF or Yoffe time distributions. So in this case, we are looking at the uh, uh, pseudo PDF, which is displaced around the Z axis, okay? And basically this Z is measuring the, uh, the Wilson line between the uh, one point of the uh, a quark field with respect to you know, moving along the Z direction. And then these matrix elements can, in principle, be factorized 
in terms of Lycom PDFs uh, due to the perturbative matching and then these coefficient functions can be calculated in perturbation theory. And the structure of this uh, relation is extremely analogous, almost identical to the relationship between the PDFs and the experimental cross-section. It's basically the same. Now, for lattice practitioners, they want to go to the other route where they actually use the other way of writing the Fourier transform to compute the, uh, the sort of pseudo PDFs and so on and so forth. But this, the problem is that if you operate at this, this, you know, in this way, you know, you cannot really apply, you know, global analysis. Of course, this version of here is what allows you to somehow uh, incorporate this matrix element as part of the global analysis in, the, in, in one single shot, right? So of course, you know, in the same way that experiments, you know, depending on what kind of observable and what kind of kinematics, not everywhere in kinematics, you know, factorization theorems are applicable. If you go to small x, then small, you know, logarithms kicks in and then you will be limited. Same story for large x. If you go to low q, there are issues. Then if you go to really high q, uh, well, it's more difficult because you have to include higher order perturbation theory. So, in principle, these games are always kind of optimal in some middle range where factorization theorem operates well to describe experimental data, at least that is expectation. And the same story happened in lattice. So in lattice, what you happen is that uh, this horizontal line is the length of the Wilson line connecting the two quark fields. And then so if you go to very large, you know, uh, um, Wilson line displacement, then you will start be sensitive to the lattice volume because of the size of the lattice. And then lattice volume effects becomes a part of the systematics. So of course, what you want to be is basically in this region where you want to have a high boost momentum so that you can go to really high Q. Because if you go to really low P, uh, P3, then you will start to be sensitive to the fineness of the lattice spacing. So, our goal in this analysis was to try to not claim victory that this is the latest PDFs of experiment plus lattice, but more like a you know um, exploratory scenario where how things look like as of last year. And so here is the uh, the inclusion of the pseudo matrix elements, uh, the real and imaginary parts can be included, which are sensitive to different combination. Uh, of the quark PDFs of U minus D. And um, so the left hand side is the lattice measurement with the uh, PDFs. And here, you, what you can see here is basically three bands. So, the, you know, what is the, what is the, uh, the matrix I'm calculated using PDFs from experimental data? And what happened when you include the lattice data, right? And you can already see by eye that things doesn't look really well. Uh, you can at the PDF space level, you can see that in reality there is a significant tension. Um, you know, by comparing, you know, uh, when when you try to include the lattice data. So in some sense, there are significant tensions of the amplitude sector, and it's believed that it has to do with the behavior of how the distribution uh, lands at larger z values. This is the you know the Wilson line uh, uh, length, right? Um, the yellow band here is what lattice practitioners, you know, extract, you know, by their own using the discrete Fourier transform. But of course, it's an inverse problem, and you know, you are very sensitive to, you know, uh, basically endpoint issues. Now, uh, this particular imaginary part uh, of the matrix element is actually sensitive to uh, to the C quark distribution because the real part is the is the is a, is sensitive to the minus, so it's only the valence part. But the imaginary part is sensitive to the C quarks. And what happens here is that, you know, if we actually look at the, the, the extracted U, bar, D, U minus Z bar asymmetry, you'll find immediately that basically it has the opposite trend with respect to the experimental data from, let's say, drill Yan uh, from EA66, which shows that D bar is larger than U bar. And of course, lattice data alone will try to pull in the other direction, but experimental data are going to be more precise and it controls that. But overall, this, you know, this kind of things is just preliminary. And you know, in reality, you know, the lattice data needs to be improved. At least we need to, um, you know, they need to work a little bit harder to accommodate for all the systematics before, before we can actually have a meaningful extraction. Now we did the same exercise for the helicity PDFs. Oh, 
I've, I forgot I, I, to say one more thing is, so suppose that all the systematic uncertainty were totally understood and things are perfect. So the question is, is it really the case that the lattice data can pose a significant con constraints given the current statistical uncertainties? So what I'm plotting here is basically the ratio uh, of the of the uncertainties of you know um, the ratio with of the moments, um, um, and what you can see is that basically, of course, with the real lattice data, we have a significant deviation. But if we were actually you know generating mock data for the lattice and try to put that mock data inside of the global analysis and compute the moments you will see that there is no way to decrease the uncertainties. So lattice plus pseudo lattice, da experiment plus pseudo lattice data really don't constrain much just because the current um, uh, lattice uncertainties are too large. So really in order to be competitive with experimental data, the lattice statistical uncertainty has to be way, way, way superior. Now this is in the context of the amplarized. We did the same exercise for the polarized, the helicity distributions. And here the story is different. Here the story is more like uh, it agrees. Uh, we find that you know, the inclusion of the lattice, polarized lattice matrix element, you know, it's just a matter of changing the correlate, you know, the uh, the Dirac structure in the correlator, including the gamma five. You can see immediately that that compared to the experimental data uh, extractions using only experimental data, which is in red, you can see the lattice can really constrain significantly better the the uh, uh, the spin PDFs. Now it is unsettling, of course, that you know it works for the polarized case, but it doesn't work for the unpolarized. I'm taking this more up about where we are in terms of you know combining lattice data with phenomenology and uh, uh, the same story about what if things were perfect and you know basically try to to incorporate the lattice data with 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 a perfect agreement with existing data and you can see that up to the fifth moment of the pdfs of this isovector combination you can see that the lattice can decrease significantly. So this is actually very important because it tells you one thing that lattice data can compete significantly more in the context of spin physics. And that is expected because the experimental data has a much larger noise associated with these asymmetries because in experiments, all the spin physics rely on asymmetries and asymmetries basically kills number of counts, right? So the statistics is always larger well, this is not this, this is not the same thing for 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 lattice QCD. Basically, the uncertainties on the spin case is the same as the unpolarized correlation functions. So we also uh, address the question about what is the role of the high Z region, which is sensitive to also uh, uh, the lat um, 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 finite volume effects. And we did a systematic analysis where we make a different cuts on the data and see how stable are the resulting PDFs. And we find that at present, we don't see any signal of, of tension among making the cuts. Basically, the extracted isovector combination for the helicity distribution are quite stable. So in principle, I will imagine that these data sets should be included at, right now on, on, on the JAM analysis that includes also the rest of the world data. Okay, so with that, this is my summary. I think that the new paradigm in, 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 in global QCD analysis, you know, can really capitalize with the use of lattice QCD, of course, with all the current, you know, caveats that is associated with it, you know, the, you know, the un, un, unquantified systematic uncertainty and so on and so forth, but really this exercise of combining with, with experiment really can inform how much the lattice data needs to be improved, where things are wrong, and, um, and, and hopefully in the near future, we can really you know, explore more exotic things like uh, twist three parts, you know, things like GT, which is very, very interesting, you know, which is, uh, is associated with a lot of uh, interesting dynamics in QCD um, at low energies like such as Jefferson Lab. And with that, I will take questions if any, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can see already there is one hand raising, Pavel. Yes, hi, Nabu. This, this is very fascinating that you can fit the lattice data together with uh, regular PDFs. Uh, concerning this difference of in situations between the unpolarized and polarized case, 
is it just uh, the issue of uh, statistics or there is some particular systematic effect, uh, let's say, that works better in polarized rather than unpolarized case? So I think it's the nature of the matrix element. So somehow, you know, if you go back to the matrix element, this is the correlator, right? So mm -hmm. all the, you know, all the lattice people are doing is changing the act structure here, whether it's a gamma plus or with a gamma phi gamma plus, that's it, right? Uh -huh. And the inclusion of that somehow, uh, you see, you can see from the unpolarized case, the large Z, you know, the, the spectrum doesn't die, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 however, for the polarized case, it seems like it died faster, although it has a like larger uncertainties. This is what the the lattice people is telling me that this, you know, the way that the correlation function dies faster at large z, you know, if it dies faster, then then it's more consistent. You know, it has less uh, finite volume effect or something like that. But that's basically the reflection. I all I can tell. Okay. Well, very interesting. Thank you. Um, actually, I also have a question on this slide exactly. So here in, in polarized case for the um, the CH matry, you have this very large uncertainty for the experiment, but the recent star data actually show um, significantly that the, it, it's actually positive in the range of X around point, intermediate X range. Um, so if that, if we take it into account, then in similar to a polarized case, um, for the polarized case here too, that um, the experiment and the, the lattice um, for this um, Uber minus Uber case, it is, um, there is a difference. Um, yes, I, I totally agree with that. Um, so, you know, um, I think yesterday, uh, Chris Kokusa gave a talk uh, where he showed the results with the W that Indeed, it shows, you know, the positive U bar minus Z bar, which is kind of the opposite. So this is one of the things that is a little bit challenging with, you know, interpreting this because it's, it's always the opposite case. Um, but um, I, I would say that up until we don't put it, you know, the W data along with this data and see really the tension, I wouldn't be able to make any conclusion, you know. So, Again, this is not like the purpose of this analysis was not like saying, you know, this is the real PDF, but it's more like proof of concept. Is, is this really real that we can afford to include lattice along mm -hmm. experimental data as a, as a, as a Bayesian priors, right? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, we can all close their eyes and pretend that, you know, QCD can describe everything in all corners, but there is a key aspect, which is factorization and we, we always have to, you know, be careful what are the kinematic ranges where this applies. So, you know, right now, lattice QCD might not be completely perfect that it will help us to, 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 to understand that aspect. And right now it's more like the opposite scenario where experimental data is informing lattice where things can, can go wrong, you know, is going wrong in the lattice side. But de definitely this is kind of a playground that hopefully in the next you know upcom upcoming years people embrace it more and, and it can help you know both communities experiment and lattice qcd right thank you um jong ming yeah just, just a simple question in the formula uh, i say it's a delta q plus delta q bar but in the figure you get delta u minus delta d how, how are they related so here q is an abbreviation for this you see this Yes. So it's delta U minus delta D. So they don't have the disconnected diagrams in their calculation. It's always U minus D. So I, you know, um, it, this is a shorthand notation for oh, okay. U minus D. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, any other question or comment? Waiting few more seconds. Uh, if not, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk again. So this was our um, end of session um, and last uh, parallel session as well. So thank you very much all the speakers and everyone who joined. Um, and we will still have one more day of the conference, which is tomorrow. We will have a plenary session starting from um, 8 a.m., I believe, in Eastern time. So thank you all and have good night. 
um, for people who record in from Europe and have a great um, afternoon, um, our ES colleague. Thank you very much.